Joe Brown is a living legend and is regarded by many as the most significant rock climber the world has ever known. My mission, if possible, is to track down the very elusive, original, upside down climber. A man known to millions of TV viewers as the human fly. His spectacular career is still surrounded in myth and legend. I was very anxious on meeting this giant among climbers to start with a well-prepared question. Well, I think to, you know, to be called the human fly uh, uh, by you is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> When I started climbing, I, I started just with a group of friends who were not climbers. None of us were climbers. We were just went messing about, uh, you know, looking for adventure, going into the elderly edge caves, doing all, all sorts of things that were adventurous. And we ended up at the downfall with a piece of rope that we always took with us for swinging about on trees and things. Nice. <coughs> and ended up doing the waterfall, the route just to the right of the waterfall, which is a V-diff. And the way we climbed it was, I went up with the rope, put the rope down, and the others came up climbing the rope where it was needed to. And, and that was the first climb we ever did. But I, that, we found this so exciting that we thought, we're going to have to do more of this. So that's what we started to do and I think in the first month uh, you know we had so little knowledge of climbing that we were actually doing new routes or attempting them and and one of the the party after probably only about three or four weekends going climbing was d doing a crack at, at the downfall which was about a 40 foot layback which you know, I would look at it with a bit of caution now. But he lay backed up until he was, you know, 30 feet or more up and eventually ran out of steam, came off, landed badly at the bottom, injured his shoulder and had, we had to carry him back to Hayfield. The, you know, we got other help. And he ended up with a withered arm and so, he, he never climbed again, but you know the the rest of us carried on climbing, uh, and um, e eventually we I asked someone, uh, a, a, you know, complete stranger who happened to be chatting to me from the top of the cliff uh, to show me how to belay because he obviously knew how to, which he didn't, and I, I that's the belay I've used the whole of my life. The, 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 the whole thing about starting to climb in that, you know, in the 40s was you never ever intended to fall off. And, you know, whereas people these days will, will happily fall off, you know, they'll just try something knowing that they can fall off and they're not going to come to any harm as long as they're on steep ground. And in those days, if you fell off, your chances were, were that you would either be injured or dead. So, you know, you didn't fall off. And, and even when it got to the uh, stage where I was using nuts and protection as good as anybody else. I still couldn't bring myself to fall on it. And I still can't. You know, I, I, I just don't ever trust it. The difference between doing a climb in the old days where you'd got pebbles in your hat and you, you climbed up you had to find the right pebble. Having found it, you then had to thread a sling, 
get a piece of wire out and hook it. I and know, I didn't know you put them in your hat. Yeah, it did. It used to climb with a balaclava on with, right. with pebbles stuck inside it. Uh, you know, and you were limited to the size of stones you could carry, obviously. I mean, if, if I mean, you couldn't go with, you know, ones as big as your fist. They would be hampering you. But what you did do is, if you'd done something and backed off, knowing that, that there was a, a possibility of getting a good runner with the right stone. Yeah. And a, an instance that springs to mind is the chalk stone, which is in the wide crack on Cenotaph. That I took up and put in on a, a, the second attempt. Okay, right. It, it wasn't there on the first attempt, but the, the second attempt, I, I had a good enough memory then to think that a stone there would m make life a lot more pleasant because then, of course, we didn't have, we still didn't have nuts, uh, and the the number of places, the, the difference between putting a a nut in and putting a, a stone and fiddling and threading it. Quite often, you'd be in quite an extreme position, having fought to the, just about the limit of your strength, threaded it, pulled it through, and you know, just thought, right, I'll clip it, and it came out because you'd, you'd disturbed it, yeah. and you had to start again. Whereas with, an, with once you got nuts, you just took it off and clipped it, and you didn't need to stop. There was no need to rest on it. Yeah, you used to have a little coil of copper wire because, you know, sometimes they, you, you couldn't reach the... Uh, the, the sling, you know, you'd thread it round the back and it was deep in the crack, so you'd get your piece of wire out, hook it out. And... The early months of climbing, you, you know, we had no idea what we were doing, but, but we, were, we were still, you know, climbing VSs without having, a, you know, anyone to, to say, well, that's a VS. I mean, to us, a climb was a climb and it was either hard or it was not. And, sort of setting your own standards. Uh, yeah, but that didn't last very long because uh, it, it, in in the first year we went to Pillar Rock, and we actually bought. The reason we went to Pillar Rock was because that was the only guidebook that was available in the local bookshop, <laughs> and and that decided where our summer holiday was going to be, <laughs> and and so the four of us went there and you know then we got to know uh, what standards were because you know you looked in the guidebook and started on a diff and found that all right and then a v diff and eventually doing vs's so had, had anything been done anywhere which you guys had a hard time on on my first leave in uh, 1949 uh, easter uh, i went on to cloggy for the first time that holiday but I also did um, Central Gully direct on Clueth which was a, a route of Men Love Edwards and that was hard it, it was hard and bold very unprotected and hard for instance I did um, Spectre which was you know hailed as one of the hardest climbs in Wales soon after and I didn't think that was anything like as hard as Central Gully Direct. Joe was emerging from an elite group who were beginning to operate in isolation, climbing to higher and higher standards. They were doing much harder routes than people had dreamt of tackling before, pushing the limits further in one year than anyone had in the previous 10. This, of course, was not without risk. I mean, I fell off on gripstone, you know, things like 20, 30 foot falls, hitting the deck uh, and, and just got away with it. Uh, I fell off uh, climbing in really atrocious weather trying to do the first ascent of uh, Vember uh, and fell off that and I, I'd fortunately managed to get one runner on 
on the pitch uh, and I was climbing on a single hemp line and be because of the amount of water that was pouring down this crack I'd traversed out of the crack onto the face round an arete and I'd reached the ledge when my hands were numb climbing in socks and the socks rolled I fell off and this hemp rope which was you know less than nine mil ran down the arete and just frayed it out just it, it, it was absolutely r rubbish the rope was but it didn't separate right. and they, they only hold 1500 pounds or so anyway so they, they you know they, that was incredibly lucky then on uh, in 1949 I was uh, on leave from the army uh, and we did all of the existing routes on Cloggy in about three days. There, there was 13 of them then, I think. Mm -hmm. The last one was um, uh, Bow Shaped Slab. And I'd, I'd led ev every pitch of every climb that we'd done. And I'd, I climbed across to uh, Narrow Slab and there was this huge pillar which I was be laying on to to be lay you had to it was so big you had to lay back up it to get the rope round it and I came down be laid brought slim across and instead of because of the awkwardness of changing the be lay I said to him it's not difficult you go to the next stance which he did and he he got to the next stance took the rope in and you know said come on when you're ready and I undid the be lay lay backed up and as I got to the top the whole pillar just peeled off with me doing a backward somersault and I probably went about 30 or 40 feet spinning you know somersaulting and landed face in just at the same time that the rope went out uh, on the grass it was grass then uh, and you know that was an, another case of uh, you know, if, if we'd have decided to swap belays there, we'd have both gone to the ground. And uh, on point five, I fell off the, the second pitch. I was very close to the stance when the ice broke away. And I went flying through the air, pulled Nat off, and altogether probably fell and bounced about, 300 feet but it, it ended up you know bouncing on very steep snow so the deceleration was very favorable and I wasn't injured at all but Nat had fallen and landed with his leg in the snow and he damaged his knee which you know was a thing that bothered him for I think probably the rest of his life. Just after I started climbing, I also started going to the library and getting everything I could on climbing. And one of the uh, uh, things that impressed me more than any was Kirkus's "Let's Go Climbing." And you know, he he was he was Wales oriented, so it, you know it became a natural sort of attraction. And I met Slim Sorrel and and his group. And we became really firm friends from that meeting and went to Wales <coughs> at Christmas time. Uh, and th it was bad weather and we did things like um, all the slab climbs and um, climbs on Holly Tree Wall and climbs on the Milestone Busters. And I, th I can't remember... Uh, I, I mean, the climbs we did, we found hard enough, but the, mm. the, uh, it, it, it wasn't the technical difficulty. It was like most people, when you get onto long routes, you know, the, the feeling is quite different to doing single pitch gritstone routes. And they, I mean, it just becomes you know from an adventure point of view it is better and better and better 
you know, the, the bigger and more outrageous things are, the more exciting and uh, ad adventure, because adventure is, is the thing from, you know, for the whole of my life, I've been climbing because it is adventure, uh, and all the other things I've done are to do with adventure. Uh, and the, the, the feeling of the excitement and pleasure is just, it's, I mean, you can either, you either do it and know it, or you'll, you'll never know it, because you can't convey it, really. More often than not, the, the weather was bad, so you were climbing in nail boots. And when we went to Wales, uh, I think it might have come from Let's Go Climbing, that in bad weather you climbed in socks. So, so that, that's what we did. And then, you know, on, um, on the right, so a, a thing that, uh, to sort of leap about a bit, at, at some time, we decided that uh, we'd do um, Lot's Groove, which was, you know, in the guidebook as the hardest climb in the guide. Mm -hmm. And it so happened that we were uh, at Mervyn's snack bar at Ogwin, at, you know, which was at the roadside, yeah. <coughs> and having a cup of tea. And the, someone said, uh, that's, that's John Lawton and John Disley. And I thought, ah, they'll know about that. So I, I, I said, we're, we're thinking of doing L Lot's Groove, but we've, you know, we're not very experienced. What do you think of it? So uh, it was John Disley, I think, said, he, he, I bet he won't remember it now, but he, he said, well, what I would do is go and try it on a top rope and if you think it's all right, have a bar of chocolate and then lead it. <laughs> and anyway, we thought, okay, we'll go and have a look at it. <coughs> and we just went to it. And I thought, oh, bugger that. You know, we'll just do it. And it, we didn't even find it hard. And the, but the important thing was, it said that in the guidebook, it said the roughest rock in Wales with the exception of Clog Winderade. And we thought, bloody hell, if Clog is rougher than this, you'd be able to climb anywhere. And, and, and the, 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 the real thing about climbing, which made it, uh, in a way, easy, was imagination. Because if, if something was described in a book as, as being you know, difficult and tiny holes and things. In your own mind, you can make them as small as, as you imagine they've got to be to get that feeling on them. So you would do this and then you'd approach the climb and find that it wasn't like that, it was covered with jugs. <laughs> and that, that was, you know, it was absolutely right, that, that the attitude that you were going to attempt something that was way beyond you, but you were going to have a look anyway. And you found that it wasn't beyond you. In fact, it, it wasn't even hard. An example of that was um, uh, the Claquet Gully, described by Murray in Climbing in Scotland. And he describes one of the pitches as these tiny nebulous holes that, you know, and, he was, you know, like a, a fairy stepping on microscopic rugosities and things. <laughs> and you get to that place and you could, you could probably, if you wanted to, you could go across it with a, your, a hand in your pocket if you wanted to. It's got big holes, and, but it, it, the imagination makes it that, you know, it's, it, well, climbing is about, to a great extent, what goes on in your head rather than, you know, whether you can do a one-arm pull-up or, yeah. or anything else. In 1951, Joe climbed five new routes in Clamberis Pass, finishing with Cemetery Gates, which he did with the late Don Willans. 
In the following year came the groundbreaking Cenotaph Corner. Imagine how it must have felt to be first to climb that amazing feature. Only Joe knows. This is the Welsh climb and is still graded E1 today. Though it is on the tick list of most aspiring hard climbers today, we must remember that when it was first done, it was the living end in terms of boldness and technical difficulty. If you're climbing for adventure, you know, the, doing new routes is far more adventurous than getting a guidebook and that tells you where the hard bits are. Yeah. You know, they, there's no comparison. The, the ultimate climbing, anyone that does new routes will agree that, you know, that they, they, you just can't beat it, it's not possible. I've had lots of occasions when I've been sorry to get to the top because it's finished and it's been so fantastic yeah, and, and now, now there isn't any more to do, so it, it, it's like, I don't know, it, it's a bit hard to compare with anything else where you don't want it to stop. Well, I could think of things, but I better not. <laughs> Perhaps the finest rock climbing cliff in Britain is Clogwyn Dirathi, on the north slopes of Snowdon above Llanberis. It is the only cliff in Britain to have a whole guidebook devoted to it, and the only one to have a whole book written about it. For the best part of a century, the leading climbers of every generation have made major advances in boldness and technical difficulty here, none more so than Joe Brown in the early 50s. After a spell of national service, Joe was back. Now he set about redefining the climbing standards of the day by adding his own new routes. The first was Diglith. Then came Vember. For some reason it just occurred to us that uh, Vember was a possible new climb to do. I, I mean, if, if you sort of look about on Cloggy, you know, you could find many more lines that were, you know, probably a better bet than Vember, but that was the one that, you know, sort of came to mind, probably through climbing curving crack and looking up that, uh, as you did more and more and realised the potential that was there, it, you didn't sort of register it like that. You didn't think, I've got, like with Gogarth, you didn't think, well, I've got a hundred climbs I can do there. It didn't, didn't work like that at all. You, you just went out and I think, what should we do today? 1952 was Joe's big year on Cloggy. He did six new climbs, the Black Cleft, Pinnacle Flake, Spillikin, Clithrig, Octo and the Corner. Most followed natural lines which had previously been considered as impossible. White, white Slab, for instance, I... From memory, I attempted it once and got as far as the lasso pitch and, and backed off from there. And then in between times, I, I went up sheaf and discovered that there was a spike that you could lasso. And then at some time later, went back to complete the climb. And we did the lasso pitch when I actually went part way up the last pitch and I was being sick from having eaten, you know, a bad sandwich. Uh, uh, and so backed off and got Ron Mosley to lead up 
uh, sheaf as a, a whale. I mean, I could just as easily have said, why don't you lead this last pitch? And that would have been the, the climb completed. And that, in, uh, in Don's book, for instance, it, he, uh, in that, I don't know whether it was in the final copy or one of the earlier ones, said that uh, we had buggered about long enough on, on this and he, he was going to do it. It was part of the, the story of the, the ascent of White Slab. Uh, and it, it actually put me in the situation of being there when he said this, whereas I was on the Mustang Tower at the time, so I wasn't even there. But in fact, all that would been is two attempts on that. After Cenotaph Corner, White Slab was arguably the biggest plum in Wales. And although Joe had climbed almost all of it in two separate earlier forays, the first ascent went to Ron Mosley and Morty Smith in April 1956. The only locals that really that we had contact, that I had contact with uh, in the early days was at the Williamses that lived at Halfway House on Snowdon. So it, if you were going up, you, you know, to Cloggy from Clamberries, <laughs> you would definitely stop there for a cup of tea or, or something. And we became very, very friendly with the Williamses and Mrs Williams became a sort of surrogate mother to the whole of us. Uh, and it, if, if I went up there on my own, you know, I would be in their kitchen with them, not sat in the, uh, in the shop uh, having tea. I'd be there with the, you know, the iron grate and the fire and things, drinking tea with them there. But they helped us in so many ways. Uh, it was because of our friendship with them that we started uh, sliding down the railway on, on boulders and things because they told us the history of the railway and how the navvies used to slide down on the shovels. So we started sliding down on anything we could find and the, the best thing was the right shaped rock. It's hard to say how, how fast you would go, but you would certainly, you really needed goggles because your eyes were, were watering. And the, the consequence of that was that if you couldn't see, when you were coming down the railway, you, you had the, the rock in the central channel, which has bumps in it. And these are just in the place that you're going down with a foot on each of these lines and you actually break by pressing your feet, at your heels at hard against the line. And if, you, if your eyes are watering, you can't see these. So you'll, you'll come down and suddenly you bang, you hit these and you're flying through the air. <laughs> I mean, it, it was fantastic. The, the, it's hard to find a good stone now because they're all down near the bottom. In all, Joe climbed 25 new routes on Cloggy. His name will forever be associated with this special place. The exploration did not stop there. During the 60s and the 70s and into the 80s, he was still at the forefront of developments in some other places in Wales.
going back to ethics, I, I was doing uh, a, a climb on Trimadoc, which is, I can't remember the name of it, uh, Grasper it was, uh, and I was right near the top and Claude was sat on the top, um, you know, looking down at me. Uh, and I was there, you know, thinking, Christ, you know, this is not easy. And I ended up getting another runner on and standing in a sling. And as I did, there was a great big hold. And I said, why don't you tell me that was there, you bastard? <laughs> he said, it's not ethical. <laughs> and he really believed that, that it was, it was cheating for him to tell me that it would be helping me. That, that was ethics. <laughs> Finding Gogarth was was just absolutely fantastic because, um, you know, Martin and Baz and Pete had not really explored it. They, they'd gone and started doing, uh, you know, Gogarth and one or two other routes, but they, they'd not done any exploration. And what we were doing was finding, you know, crags, n not climbs, whole, whole, places. whole places like yeah. No one had seen Castle Helen, for instance. Uh, it, it, the Red Wall was a, a very obvious thing, but no one, uh, you know, that was treated with such respect that no one even thought of actually going on it. Um, you know, when Slab was discovered <coughs> by a group of us going for a walk and looking back from this cliff walk and seeing the top of it sticking out, and so walking back and seeing that fantastic zone, it, you know, we're doing two, I think, uh, climbs a day sometimes. I think on one occasion we did three. And, um, but, but uh, on another occasion we did uh, a hard route on uh, Mousetrap Zone, Primate, I think it was, and then went over uh, and went right along the Gogar Traverse and did the farthest left climb at the end of that, which is a f another 5C, both in the same day, which is, I mean, that's an extraordinary. Looking back on that, you think, mm. why did you do that? I mean, I'd, I'd you do it. You a couple of climbs in Mousetrap, <laughs> couldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> it seemed really funny because they were just things that were there things that you you no, did that, on previous occasions. No, I mean, I mean, how did I know that crack was there at the end of that traverse? Because it's not possible. It's not visible. It's not visible, is it? No. No, the only way you find it is by going, so you can't traverse any further. As soon as the quarry closed, people started exploring it, not from the point of view of climbing particularly, but just exploring it for, for uh, uh, scrap and souvenirs and, you know, all sorts of things. We found that uh, if, if you walked up the screed just a, a, a short distance and traversed to the first tunnel, you, you looked into this tunnel and you could see a tiny bit of light at the end, but with, it was so small, you had no idea how far away it was. Uh, so we, uh, I think it was Claude and myself, but it might have been Pete and me, uh, set off into it and, and we, you, you know, you're sort of feeling your way along and eventually you realised it wasn't miles away. What it was was the light shining on a, a, a slab of slate through a hole that was in the top of the tunnel. And you just climbed up through this boulder choke 
And there you were in the bottom of the big hole. And you can imagine to get in the bottom of the big hole and see this, you know, 650 foot or 700 foot of, of cliff above you, it was jaw dropping. Yeah, you just went, yeah. bloody hell. Very soon after we found the way in, like a day or two later, uh, I, I think, I'm not certain without asking Claude, we went and did what was opening Gambit, which was an absolutely brilliant climb because it, it was about hard, severe, mild VS on almost every pitch. N nothing harder and not much easier. And it, it had a bit of debris here and there on ledges, but not very much. And it was, to me, I thought, that is an absolutely three-star fantastic climb. If you go and climb in the rain, well, that can only be, well, I suppose you could do it for, to impress people and say, I've been climbing in the rain. But if, if that's not the reason, then, the reason can only be that your search for adventure is, you know, getting fed by it, which is, you know, I, I've climbed hundreds and hundreds of times in the rain and r routes of all standards, and I've never ever once come back from climbing in bad weather and thought I shouldn't have done that. I've always thought, what a fantastic day we've had. My memories of climbing on Cloggy are nearly always climbing in bad weather that springs to mind and, you know, thrutching your way up a chimney route with water pouring off everything. Right. And, yeah. and uh, I, I mean, they're, they're, they're fantastic memories. I used to get incredibly embarrassed because I used to I used to meet people on grit who would start talking about me to me, <laughs> and and it, you know that became doubly embarrassing because you know embarrassed to be you to be talked about, but it, the other embarrassment was how did you get out of it? Because you know if you said well, I'm Joe Brown, you know, the, the bloke would think, you know, he'd be embarrassed or he'd think, you know, bullshit or whatever. And, and But it, I've eventually, you know, got a, a, a way of, as soon as I realised that it was going to happen, I would, you know, stop it by letting them know who I was. So, are you comfortable with being a legend? Not, no, not not all that much. I, I uh, uh, make makes you become shy and withdrawn. Oh yeah, Don Williams. Yeah, there's. Um, and you know, because I climb with him all the time. You know that that was an easy thing to say. Well, you know that was so. But other people like um, Al Alan Austin, uh, Pete Greenwood, people like that, uh, Paul Ross. I didn't have enough contact with them to know. You know to do any comparison. But I, I'm quite sure that. You know, certainly Paul Ross was climbing at the same standard. Um, Alan Austin was in my book. Uh, but, you know, there weren't very many. I, I've been lucky in many ways that, uh, you know, lucky that I found climbing at the time that I did was, you know, if, uh, you know, if you started climbing now, it'd be very difficult to 
have the opportunities that I had. Well, they, they're, they're just not. I mean, if you if you think back to um, you know not the forties, there was I mean, they, they, they had not been touched, had it? There were thirteen routes on Cloggy. How many are there now? About 180 or something. It, it's such a, a unique pastime climbing because you can you you set your own standards really. Is that running? <laughs> 